Although I realize probably the first half of today isn't too, or first two thirds of today isn't too actionable. You're not going to go breaking off. It's funny in the performance classes, the performance classes, I catch a lot of people by the end of the first day are like going through their SQL servers and they're trying to make changes. Cause of course there's things that are safer to do when you're talking about a performance class, as opposed to a production DBA class. The whole role of this is don't break things. Don't touch things, leave them, you know, get them consistent. Whereas the performance people are all, oh, let me monkey with this now. Let me go see if this changes anything. Let me go see if I can fix this. All right. In the last module for today, we're going to talk about building an inventory and support matrix, uh, which kind of leads to some of the questions that people were asking before the session started or in the first module around what's normal at companies or what's normal for me to do personally or what can I expect? This book, Getting Things Done by David Allen, absolutely changed my life. Not an understatement, truly changed my life. I was going to track stuff in text files. I would try, and I'm not a lazy person. I would track all kinds of detail in text files about here's the things that I need to do next. Here's what's my big picture stuff. Here's the things I need to go tackle. And I'm not really a fan of productivity books. I'm not one of those people who reads a lot of productivity books because they say a lot of lame stuff like, work smarter, not harder, you know, just be more productive, get things done. And this book is radically different. This book is really focused on knowledge workers, which is what we are. We sit in front of a desk and we push buttons and click on things using our brains. We Google, we look for solutions, we use our BS detector. And it doesn't matter how good we are, we're never going to catch up. There's never going to be a day when you're sitting in your desk and you're like, man, you know what? I just, I don't have anything to do today. I'm, I'm, you know, everything I wanted to get done is done. My servers are perfect. Everything's patched. It all runs quickly and flawlessly. I don't have anything on my to-do list. Guess I'll just go read blogs for a while today. And I'm not saying that you should never read blogs. Of course you should as a guy with a blog and I read blogs, but the catch is you're always going to feel under the gun. You're always going to feel stressed out. You walk out of training classes and you're like, man, I don't have my RPO and RTO in writing. Now I know worse things about corruption. I'm pretty sure I have corruption in various places. It's always going to be bad. It just is never going to be good as a knowledge worker. You're always going to feel under pressure. But there's an interesting line in the cover right here, the art of stress-free productivity. This is what really interested me about the book and what really made a difference in my life. Being stress-free means having a really clear, written, can't be mental, a written to-do list of the stuff you have to do at work. Being completely at peace with, when I leave work, there will be stuff waiting for me at the office forever, always. It doesn't matter how good you are. You cannot catch up. The best you can hope to do is get to some feeling like you're ahead, but there will always be more things waiting for you. The more you learn at classes like this, especially the stuff we go into and tomorrow, people go, oh my God, these are things I never thought about. I got to go fix those. And your to-do list will always get longer. Now, however, when you leave work and you go switch contacts over into your personal life, your family life, you have a to-do list there too. There are things that my wife wants me to do, things I need to do around the house, things that I want to do to be a better brother or son. There's things that I love to do for myself. I want to take a vacation. I want to go sit out on the deck and relax with a beer. There's things that we want to get done. And if you just let your work to-do list completely monopolize your personal life, that's a quick roadmap for a divorce. That's a quick roadmap for miserable families, not seeing your kids grow up. You have to balance all the different contexts in your life because you're never going to win or be finished at any of them. There's no final boss that you're going to go battle. It was really hard for me as a database administrator because I didn't even know how many servers I had. I'm kind of shocked now when I talk to people as I, I go in and say, all right, how many production databases do you have? And nobody knows. They don't know how many production servers they have. And when they think they know, they're usually wrong. Like we'll go run some kind of survey tool out across the network and be like, well, you said 62, but 
there's 148 SQL servers in your production subnet alone. I would ask, all right, so I'd take a new job and all right, which SQL servers are in production? Well, that, that, that's what we hired you to go figure out. You, you go manage that. Well, aren't you even going to tell me how many I have or what their names are? No. And I had to go figure it out. What are these databases on this server? There's like 40 databases on here. Who should I talk to when there's a problem with one of the databases? Who's responsible for changing it? Which one should be on standard edition? Which one should be on enterprise edition? Are users happy? And then anytime that anything broke, whether I was involved in it or not, and especially if I lost data, like if I had to recover from backup, right? I always felt like it was my fault. Even though I didn't have anything to do with the budget on how these things were built, sometimes people would come to me and go, here you go, you only have $14 and a can of Pringles. I need you to never lose data and it can never go down. And I would feel bad like I was missing something obvious, like, oh, I, I, there's a switch that I should click in SQL Server and I'm missing that switch. This particular session is about turning that around and is about understanding what it feels like to be a just stress-free database administrator and feeling confident walking through your database career going, I know exactly where I'm at and what I need to do next. The art of stress-free databases administration means, number one, I'm going to sketch out a strategy of where I want to go to, what I want to make my environment look like, that I'm going to be happy when it gets to this point. Step two, I'm going to make a list of all the SQL servers that I have to get to that promised land. Number three, I'm going to take the difference between all this hot mess of a server and the promised list of where I want to get to, make a prioritized list of here's the things I need to do in order to get to that promised land. And then I'm just going to share this with management once a month or once a quarter and go, all right, here's the list of the hot mess that I got. Here's where I'm driving towards everybody cool with this. You're not going to be able to make perfect progress. You're never going to be in the promised land. The idea is that you just want to make sure that your vision of where you want to go with management lines up with where they want you to go on the right timeline. A good example of this is that the DBA team I talked about earlier, how they built a big complex always on availability group trying to get to zero data loss. And as soon as we got them in the room with management, management's like, no, 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 no. you can, you can lose lots of data, go home. I'm like, well, well, I, I don't want to lose data management. I'm fine with it. Go take a vacation. Go. It's, it's built. We're going to lose a day of data. If it goes down, that's fine. Get out of here. Go enjoy your families. You know, we don't want you stressing out. If only all the jobs were that easy. <laughs> so step one, we're going to design a strategy of where we want to go. If you go into the first responder kit, there's this SQL server support matrix or SQL server technical documentation. And I started this back when I worked at a company and I was so sick and tired of vendors bringing me a matrix of here's what we support. Project, project managers would come in and say, oh, we're bringing in SharePoint. Right, here's the list of things that they require. And I'm like, you want what? No, we don't. None of this. No, you can't have your own SQL server. No, you can't be SA on things. And they say, well, this is, this is our support matrix. This is what we support. And sometimes with vendors like SharePoint, you know, when it's big companies like Microsoft, you, you have to agree to whatever they want because they're huge. But I got super frustrated because even crappy software vendors would come in or my own internal teams, my developers would go, uh, yeah, we need a SQL Server 2007 box and it needs to have 13 gigs of RAM. I'm like, what? You're making numbers up. There is no, that's not even a real version. Over time, I learned from working with my project managers that there's this language in enterprises of a support matrix that enterprises are expected to have a grid of what they'll support and what they won't support. And it was my job as a database administrator to build that matrix. So here's the matrix that I came up with. This is only the first page and there's going to be another page that we're going to go through. But here's what I said, and it's inside your resources in the first responder kit. I have four kinds of servers here. I have mission critical production, regular production, QA, and then dev. If it's mission critical production, am I going to back it up off site? Yes, because the way that this particular company worked was that we had some, not much, but a limited amount of off site DR backup space, and we could back up to that every hour. 
How much backup history would I maintain and how often would the backups run? When is our scheduled downtime, say the third Saturday of the month? I'd have less downtime for mission critical production and more downtime for production, but still not all the time. I still had to agree to with the teams to a window, but this was our default starting point. Sometimes you'll see with folks, oh, it can never go down. It absolutely has to be up all the time. Okay, great. You're going to be in the mission critical production category. You're going to see some interesting things about that category as we move forward. For example, where my backups go, what edition of SQL Server I have. Here, in order to be mission critical production, it has to be on Enterprise Edition was the decision that I made. For example, if I'm going to rebuild an index, I have to be able to rebuild an index. In order to do that, it's got to be online. If it has to be 24-7 online, there you go with production, with mission critical. However, if we were allowed to take some downtime and we were allowed to lose some data, then I'd be willing to cut it back and you can run on the cheaper standard edition. I'm still going to be on call 24-7 for both production and mission critical. It's just that the standards are a little higher over there in mission critical production. If I can't go down and I can't lose data, that means no one's allowed to go run in and make changes over in the mission critical production. However, over on just plain old production, I'm willing to let people take a few risks and take gambles. If you want to go in and change stuff in the production database, I'm fine with it. You're not going to get any production or any uh, sysadmin permissions over in the mission critical database. When I go on to lower tiers like QA test and dev, it's not that I don't care about them, but I'm only going to care about them between 9 and 5. If you break the development server at 10 p.m. on a Saturday, that's not my problem. You're going to file a ticket for it, and it will not be considered an emergency. And when I first said stuff like that, I thought I was going to get this awful reputation. I thought management was going to hate my guts. My boss actually called me into his office and closed the door, and he said, I just want you to know that I'm really excited that you built this. It takes the team up to the next level. This is the kind of enterprise expert guidance that I really wanted when I hired a DBA. We wanted some kind of big picture vision to tell us what's normal and what's not normal in these different classes of environments. Now remember, I am building the promised land. This is what I want it to look like. It may not start here. It may be a hot mess initially when I get started, but I'm going to work towards a vision of what I want. And I really have to say that before I show you the next slide, because here's where permissions start in. In mission critical production, are users allowed to change tables and views? Now, in the shop that where I initially wrote this, I was fine with users changing tables and views, even in mission critical, because I am amazing at throwing people under the bus. That is probably one of the best skills that I have. I am incredibly good at positioning a user right in front of the bus and then watching as the bus runs right past and flattening that guy. For example, if one of my developers wants permissions in production, sure, go right ahead. Because the instant that you screw something up, I'm going to put your name in the help desk ticket. I'm going to email all of the users. I'm going to say, attention, everyone. Currently, production is down because Bobby, the developer, ran an inadvertent update statement. I will keep you updated on what Bobby is doing to solve this problem as soon as Bobby lets me know anything. If you have any questions about what Bobby did or why, please feel to stop by his feel free to stop by his cubicle. It's right next to the coffee maker on the third floor. If he's not there, you can call Bobby's cell phone number at 832-555-1212. Everyone knew that if you do something stupid on my database servers, you had better be wearing that asbestos suit because you're going to get hit by the bus real quick. You go to most big enterprises, though, and they'll say things like, no, end users aren't allowed to change tables and views, either in production or mission critical production. Can users restore databases or kill queries? For me, that's a no on mission critical. Even though I might let you change tables, I'm not going to let you kill someone else's query or restore a database over on top of someone else. I won't even allow you to do that in production. But notice there's an asterisk here. 
those features are available to you if you're in your own dedicated virtual machine. If you get your own SQL Server, I don't care what you do it. If you want to kill someone's queries, if you want to restore databases, that's totally cool. But I just can't have you do that in the mission critical environment where I'm the one who has to fix whatever you did as quickly as possible. A classic example is doing a rollback after a kill can take hours and make my database server effectively unusable. Can users be sysadmins? No, not unless you're on your own VM. And again, I have really easy ways to fix that. If someone comes in and says, well, I want my own database and it needs to be on that production server over there. Okay, that's cool. I'll, I'll add you a database. I want to be sysadmin. I'm sorry, that's not allowed on the shared server. Oh, it's really important. I'm, I'm from the president's office. You got to let me do it. Okay, can you do me a favor? Come with me for a minute. We're going to walk over to Mary's office. Mary's the chief accounting officer or CFO, and she also has databases on that server for our accounting software. Mary, meet this yo-yo. Yo-yo, meet Mary. Mary, I'd like you to like to introduce you to this person because they want to be able to drop your databases, delete your data, trash your connections, kill your queries. Is that cool? No, I've never met this guy and he doesn't smell particularly good. All right. I'm just going to get out of the way and I'm going to let powerful people fight it out. Oh, I love those nature shows when those lions go after each other. I'm like, just let those big, powerful animals go fight it out. I'm just a lowly database administrator. I'll do whatever you tell me to as long as all the users are okay with it. Sometimes Mary will say, sure, that's cool. I trust this guy. I've known him for forever. In which case, I let him have it. Fine. You got it. You want it. You want it. You got it. I'm just here to execute on whatever the business needs. I'm not here to come up with my own uh, ideas. Can users remote desktop into the database server? No, not unless you've got your own SQL server. The performance guarantee, it will be high, and I will do a detailed level of performance troubleshooting. Doesn't mean I can make it fast, but I will try my best to say, here's why the thing isn't quicker. Sometimes it's hardware, sometimes it's code. And I also have in here, here are the SQL Server names. Because sometimes users will say, well, I want whatever Prod SQL 03 has. I want just to be just like him. Okay, great. I'll give, I know exactly what tier that falls into. That's in the production tier. I want something more like Prod SQL 05. That thing's a monster. Yep, it's mission critical production. I can totally get you that. And now people have an idea of what cost looks like because I can say, here's what something in the mission critical prod tier costs. I'm going to start, remember, because this is the promised land, I'm going to start by designing the best environment that I think I could actually pull off at the company, especially when we start to talk about security and who can remote desktop in and how long my backup history is, what my RPO and RTO is. It's just about painting the picture of the promised land so that when someone comes in and wants a new server, I can hand them this document and say, you pick your column. It's, if I can give people choices on either A or B, then they have a much easier way to get started. If someone comes in and says, yeah, we, we need SQL Server on Linux. I say, oh, here's our support matrix. That's not in the support matrix yet. But if you want to pick one of these options, you can have one of these. Well, I'm sorry. What our support matrix only has SQL Server on Linux. Oh, you know what? Ours doesn't. Guess we won't be able to work together. I'm really, I love stuff like that. Oh, I thrive on those kinds of conflicts. I'm just a jerk about that. Now, a senior DBA is all about saying, I'm going to get to this picture of a promised land. I'm going to sketch out what our inventory needs to look like. I may not, as a senior DBA, fill in every box. For example, figuring out which servers are mission critical versus which servers are prod, what our current RPO or RTO is. But a senior DBA is faced with questions like the ones you see on the screen, and that support matrix makes answering these questions way easier. These are the kinds of questions you want to expect once you become a senior DBA. So now I have my picture of the promised land. I got the picture of where I want to get to. Now I have a different problem. I got this hot mess over here. I got a big list of SQL servers. Usually I don't even have a list. They're just like, go find your SQL servers and tell us what's involved. This is another worksheet in the first responder kit. 
This thing says, here's my inventory of SQL servers. And I keep it really simple because in a lot of enterprises, we do already have some kind of form that we like to use. But if you don't have a form, start here. It's as simple as possible. It just says, here's my list of SQL servers. Here's the databases or database groups on there, like all the sales databases and then all the sales reports databases. Here's the version of SQL Server it's at. Here's what compat level the databases are, which starts to become much more important around 2014. Licensing, this isn't a column that's going to add things up. I'm just trying to get a rough idea of where is my licensing coming from? Because very often, senior DBAs even have no idea what's going on in the licensing department. We have no idea where this licensing is coming from. My RPO and RTO, RPO, remember, is how much data I'm willing to lose, and RTO is how long I'm allowed to be down for. What my maintenance windows look like, often when I first get started with this, we're not allowed to take outages at all, and we have to schedule every one in advance. And as you notice this, you'll notice when you go through the spreadsheet that a lot of the columns are hidden. As you unhide more and more columns, there's much more around security, compliance, backup and recovery, where the files go. It's terrifying when you first start looking at everything you don't know, but this is only for our eyes. This isn't for end users. This is for communicating between me and my manager just how bad of shape we're in. Having lots of empty squares on there is fine because management knows I don't know everything about the environment yet. I have to go assess my environment in order to build a good written inventory. So to start with getting that list of SQL servers that I'm going to go tackle, first off, there's my monitoring server and all my list of help desk tickets that have come in recently. That starts to give me a rough idea of what SQL servers are out there. But then I want to go start tackling which SQL servers I don't know about. The three tools on the right, they're kind of a range from easy to use to more challenging to use. The top one, Dell, which is now Quest uh, Discovery Wizard. Quest Discovery Wizard is a totally free tool that goes and pings all the IPs on your subnets, tries to connect on port 1433, it does port scans. It'll try to connect with logins that you specify. Like if you have a bunch of uh, SA logins that are just defaults that everybody uses, the same password throughout the company, it'll try to connect in with those SA passwords. Now, when you do this, or really any of the tools on the right, if you have any kind of security tools that alert on pings or network sweeps, they will cause alerts. So this is something that doesn't always work in large enterprises or can get you in trouble in large enterprises. But so what then what this thing will also do is it'll run additional queries like SP Blitz or it'll run health assessment queries for you to tell you about the SQL servers that it found. The next one down, the map toolkit, this is used by licensing auditors and it goes through and finds out things in Active Directory and on SQL servers itself. This is a little less friendly and produces less valuable stuff for me. And then finally, their SQL Power Doc. This is an open source uh, utility that was written by Kendall Van Dyke. Used to be an independent consultant and has since gone into Microsoft, actually. It hasn't been very well up maintained. But if you're an independent consultant, you might like this. I don't. I'm just saying I know a lot of independent consultants who do. Because what it'll do is it'll assess a bunch of SQL servers and give you Excel spreadsheets about all kinds of inventory and management details. I personally, I just start with Discovery Wizard and then call it a day. It finds way more SQL servers than I was even comfortable that I, than, that I didn't want to know about. After I go through and just make the list of SQL servers, next I'm going to go gather SP Blitz on all of them. SP Blitz is our totally free open source health check that just tells you things like, are backups being done? Is there CheckDB that's reported corruption? Have I got uh, auto shrink turned on? Just a lot of basic and, and even more advanced performance issues. Am I seeing thread pool weights, for example? I'm also going to capture support end of life dates for hardware, my operating system, and my storage. Because if someone says, this is medicine critical and it can never go down. Oh, so that I should be able to call for support when it breaks. Oh, absolutely. Oh, you know what? It's out of support and has been out of support for three years. Oh, is it? Is that a trick question? Were you tricking me? 
Anything that is mission critical has to be under support. This is how you start to play the DBA game. Now, it's really tough when you run stuff like SP Blitz that it's really tough to immediately want to jump in and take action. Oh, my God, there's four backup jobs that haven't run since January. There's these three check DB jobs. If you start playing around, change equals risk. Anytime you change anything on a running SQL server, you are running a gamble. For example, if you suddenly enable a bunch of CheckDB jobs that weren't enabled before, and they all start running at the same time across multiple servers, the lights can go dim in the data center, and you can run into all kinds of screaming about performance issues. So what I'm going to do is first just build the spreadsheet of the hot mess that I have now, leaving open the empty areas that I don't know yet, and now I need to prioritize which areas I'm going to go tackle first. For priorities, one of my favorite places to start is Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. Maslow was a psychiatrist, I believe, back in the 60s, who came up with this little pyramid hierarchy of needs to say, if human beings haven't slept in 72 hours, they're not going to do good jobs at the higher things in their hierarchy of needs. You've got to take care of the basics first in order to start to project or uh, progress up to higher and higher levels. That made total sense to me. I thought it was genius when I first saw it. And I went, you know what? It's really the same thing in SQL Server. There are a few core things that we have to take care of. And if we don't take care of those first core things first, it's really hard to do the stuff up on the top. It's really interesting to say, I'm going to go focus on performance tuning because users love it when I do performance tuning. But if you don't have security under control, anyone can go behind you and break what you just did. Especially I hated performance tuning when I had that guy back behind me at the shop who would go in and performance tune himself by doing things like setting max dop to one or running DBCC free proc cache. So coming up this hierarchy of needs, the first level is I can't lose more data than the business is comfortable losing. It's not that you can't lose data. You can and you will. But I don't want to lose more data than the business agrees that we should be okay losing. If the business says, you're never allowed to lose data, great, I'm going to sketch out a budget for what it would take to accomplish that, at which point the business always says, oh, you know what, we could probably lose a little data. Let's see what we could do if we could lose, say, an hour's worth of data. And then that totally changes how your whole project sketches out. After I've nailed that down, where I just am to the point where I'm not going to lose more data than the business is comfortable with, which means both backups and check DB, because corruption, like we talked about this morning, the second layer up is knowing who has access. I'm not going to say that only the DBAs can have sysadmin level access, because that just doesn't work in modern businesses. Often, there's lots of people on the team who are going to end up having sysadmin rights. I just want everyone on the team to be aware of who can drop databases, kill queries, run restores over the top of existing databases. As long as everyone on the team understands the risks, we can progress up to the next level. I just need to check that sysadmin list and make sure everybody's on the same page. Then we start to talk about capacity and performance management. But when you sketch out this document, the first thing that's the toughest is... How much data am I willing to lose and how long am I allowed to be down for? These are actually performance metrics too, because if your server can't back up and run CheckDB fast and frequently enough, you have a performance issue right there. Often I find that just buying enough hardware to run CheckDB and backup solves a lot of my performance issues. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go fill in the holes in my spreadsheet. I'm just going to highlight everything that scares me, the stuff that I want to fix in my next round of going and discovering things, not even fixing them. I'm just discovering things first. Then I'm going to go talk to management and say, all right, here's what I don't know. I don't know how much data we would lose if this box went down. I don't know how long we would down, be down for if this box went down. Then I'm going to go gather it. And the only thing that's a higher priority to me is actual outages. Now, at this point, I have a spreadsheet that tells, oops, oh, 
Now at this point, I have a spreadsheet that tells me at least how bad of shape I'm in. The hot mess spreadsheet over on one side. I have an idea of where I want to go. And then I know how much data I'm going to lose today if one of these SQL servers crashes. Here's the hardest part. You're always going to be under stress. People are always going to be bringing you more SQL servers. Things are always going to get worse. You're going to run out of backup space. You're going to have to you know, politically argue with folks on how you get the right amount of backup space or how much of an overhead your backup jobs have or how you performance tune your backups. And you will never be able to keep up. The more that you learn about SQL Server and your servers, the more terrified you're going to be about your SQL servers. I know extreme edge case shops where they're never allowed to lose data and never allowed to go down, and they'll have a dozen or more database administrators hovering around a single SQL Server, just making sure it's going to stay alive. That's not what most of us are really facing. When we start to sketch out what the costs are, management starts to really change their tune and go, Oh, you know what? We're not doing too bad. I guess we could lose a little bit of data and our life would go on. So the last step in here is sharing our work with management is being able to say, here's what we're up against. So here's my spreadsheet for the month. I set a meeting with my manager every month. Here's what the spreadsheet looks like now. Here's the areas of the spreadsheet that I'm working with over the course of the next month. And here's the promised land that I'm still striving to get towards. This is important for me as a database administrator because it's really hard to get raises as a database administrator. Oh, it is really hard because they ask you, what'd you do this year? And my answer is usually like, well, the server didn't usually go down. And when it did go down, it probably wasn't my fault. <laughs> that doesn't work for getting raises. Instead, what works is you take your spreadsheet from where you were at the beginning of the year. Then you take your spreadsheet for where you were at the end of the year and you show your boss, this is what a hot mess we had when we started. Here's what the less hot mess looks like these days. And we've been able to fix this, 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 and this. As you go forward in time, you're going to learn more about what it takes to fix certain issues more frequently. For example, if you start with a SQL server with nothing but full backups daily, here's how long it takes us to implement full recovery model, set up transaction log backups, test those transaction log backups, get T logs set up, and then know that we're actually restoring and testing those on a regular basis. This is how management decides to get you more help. If they look at that spreadsheet and go, wow, man, it hasn't changed in the last six months. You haven't made any progress because you've been fighting help desk tickets the whole time. This environment is still in a terrifying state. What works is if you share with them the things that scare you and then they see it, they won't be able to sleep either. I loved being able to say to my manager, you know what? It makes me nervous every time I leave here because I know I don't have backups yet on these four servers and I'm just not making progress fast enough. Then they get worried because they're going to be in trouble too if they lose data. And then it becomes a question of how do we make progress faster? One way you could do it is to add people. I don't say that as a guy who runs a consulting company because I don't do staff like fulfill or staff uh, augmentation work. This is hiring long-term contractors, people who are going to be there for three months or six months or 12 months. But you know how it is when you hire new people, they don't make a lot of progress right away. They're not very good right away. And you have to get them the laptop. You have to teach them how you work. You have to get them into the VPN. You have to teach them what you want, what reports you want on a regular basis. That kind of sucks. That's actually not that fast of a way to get more progress quickly. It'll work long term, but you just got to think in the span of one year, two years, three years, not in terms of one or two or three months. Second thing that you can do is reduce your surface area. When I talk about building the brand new promised land, Often, whenever I get a new piece of hardware, I'll go build it according to the promised land specs and go, here's what we're going to go build out. It's bulletproof secure. It's fast. It's backed up the way that I want. Now, if you want to come with me from that cesspool awful database server over there and move up into the promised land, 
just know that when you come up here, you're not going to be SA. I'm not bringing your SSIS packages. You're going to have a different SSIS server. We're not going to bring your CLR code along. This is the promised land. This is where we're getting to. If I build this nicer thing that has less surface area, it makes my job easier. This is also one of the reasons that people are excited about the cloud. I'm going to have like one hour that we talk through about the cloud in two days from now. And it's important, but I don't think it's super important for most senior DBAs. It will be over time. It's just not super, super important right now. But one of the cool things about it is it takes away the parts of the job you never really like to do, like backups. None of us really like to do backups or check DB. We just have to when we're down on premises. But in Azure and Amazon RDS and Google Compute Engine, it's well, not Google Compute Engine, but Amazon RDS and with Azure SQL DB, it's just a matter of setting a, a knob and saying, here's how many backups I want to keep. Here's how much it's going to cost me. It's just a simple cost equation. You can also make progress faster by doing less work. There's Brent sounding like a productivity book, but what it really means is, you know how there's that border we talked about where what's done by the Windows team versus what's done by the database team? Well, sometimes you may want to offload work to other teams. If I'm looking at that spreadsheet and saying to my boss, here's what a hot mess we're in. You know what? Maybe I should let the Windows team handle backups. I don't like it. I wish they wouldn't use tools like NetBackup or Veritas, but if it's their problem and if they agree to go on the line for it, maybe I'm okay with that because I have bigger problems maybe around security, around compliance that only I can go tackle. Reprioritizing tasks. When someone comes running into me and says, Brent, I need you to spend two hours tuning this query right now. It's so much easier when I open up this spreadsheet and go, all right, here's the stuff I'm working on right now. We don't have good backups in SharePoint. Is tuning your query more important than getting backups in SharePoint? Often they say, no, 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 you know what? Oh, I had no idea. I didn't know you were like that. If they do say, yes, it's more important, then I can take that spreadsheet with me into my boss and say, all right, Bob from the SharePoint team wants, or Bob from whatever team wants me to tune this query. Are we all in agreement that I should spend the next two hours tuning Bob's query instead of fixing the broken backups on the SharePoint server? I don't care what I do. I used to take it really personally as a database administrator that everything had to be perfect, but I'm going to be working for the rest of my life on these SQL servers. I don't care what they want me to do first, as long as everyone in the team is on the same page about what a hot mess we have and which parts of the hot mess I focus on first. The big thing with stress-free database administration is to sketch out, here's the promised land where I want to be, here's the hot mess that I have right now, Here's the tasks I'm going to work on in the hot mess to make it look like the promised land and then just keep sharing it with management every month to say, here's what I'm working on and here's what I'm going to go tackle next. <laughs>